Good morning, everyone. Morning. Uh, good morning, and thank you for joining morning. us. So we're delighted to be hosting this session for Dynamo 2022, showcasing digital stories from the voluntary sector. My name is Anne Fry from Vaughan. We're the regional support body for the voluntary community and social enterprise sector. And I'm here with Adam Hill from Sunderland Software City, who support the tech sector in the region, and Julie Nicholson from Digital Voice, who I'll introduce properly shortly. So um, Vaughan and Sunderland Software City have been leading Tech for Good initiatives for a number of years across a different number of organisations and different roles. We've been working together um, for a number of years. And I'm going to give a very, very brief overview of the sorts of things we have been doing. And then we're going to hear from um, organisations about their own experiences of using digital. So I am going to attempt to share my screen. Bear with me. There we go. Somebody tell me that you can see that. All yeah. Good. Brilliant. So before COVID, pre-COVID, Vaughan and Consultant Design started off with a series of social tech northeast, which were networking meetups to bring the tech sector and the voluntary sector together to inspire and share stories and learning. So then Software City also managed the Northeast Social Tech Fund and Vaughan joined the charity Digital Code which is a national initiative, um, a code of perhaps to support charities to adopt and use digital. Um, and then COVID happened and we all know, we all know what happened. Everything moved online, the pace of change accelerated and we um, started working in the field of digital inclusion. And that's a big work area for Vaughan that we are continuing. So more recently, Vaughan and Sunderland Software City have collaborated on a three year cross-sector partnership called Digital Pathfinders. But everything that we do, we, we try to keep in mind of a, a vision. It's a, it's a bit of an informal vision that Adam and I share, but I've written it down. Um, and that is that the VCSE sector and the digital sector can work together as equal partners to achieve positive change. And for me, those words equal partners are really, are really key in this. So Digital Pathfinders is a three year programme. We're just over one year into it. Um, and Vaughan is the VCSC delivery partner for it. And it's a series of masterclasses and free bespoke 12 hours of one support. And again, we decided quite early on that it was useful to have some overarching principles of working, um, which I've, I've written down there. And, it, and it's all about it's people first, not tech and the independence of the program and the independence of the advice is crucial we're building capacity in the voluntary sector to allow people to make their own decisions not um, guide them to to a sort of single solution and we really encourage our digital experts and our voluntary sector organizations to respect each other's areas of expertise Nobody understands our people and communities like the voluntary sector organisation that we work with. And we found that um, there are any number of digital experts, but finding people who can work with charities, especially small charities, often with uh, no paid staff, um, and who can understand their language and their values and their operating environment. Um, it's a small pool and we're really keen to sort of build that, build that community. So at this point, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I am going to introduce Julie Nicholson from Digital Voice, who's going to share her experiences. So Digital Voice um, use digital and Julie's going to talk about how it brings about changes for the organizations that they work with and the marginalized people that they support. So Julie, over to you. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Hi everyone. And uh, thanks for listening to Digital Voices, Digital Story. 
Um, so Digital Voice is a multi-award winning community interest company. We're based in the Northeast, but we work across the country and uh, we've been going for 15 years now. And we use creative digital media to help people to uh, have a voice and to develop skills, digital skills, and also those really important transferable skills that are good for, uh, for getting jobs and for life. Um, but I uh, haven't always been in the digital stuff and I started uh, as a youth worker 20 years ago doing whatever the groups of young people I support want to do. So um, DJing, graffiti workshops, skateboarding. Um, we were called Ultimate Youth then and um, a group of girls asked if they could make a video. And so uh, that's how I got into digital media. Um, because I saw the power of the digital media to give them a voice and um, they wanted to make a film about drugs and alcohol issues for young women um, and it just went from there really. Um, so after a few years we started working with older people and people with learning disabilities and so then became a digital voice for communities and became a CIC. Um, so we do, we have a range of programs that help people to develop digital skills and a lot of it is around digital inclusion for older people, um, people with learning disabilities, people who have less access to digital skills courses. Uh, and what we do is try and make it fun, fun and informal. So we run, um, we have for quite a few years now run in touch courses where we help people to get online, stay safe. Um, and we do that in a in a fun way in community lounges uh, across the northeast. But we developed this intergenerational digital skills group with uh, Gateshead Housing Company um, when it became obvious that there were some people who just didn't really see the benefit of digital. Um, so they asked us to come up with a course that would involve uh, bringing together a group of older people with um, young buddies. You can see their school children. And they worked in pairs to do a series of digital tasks together. Um, so it was all good fun learning about each other by using the internet. So finding out what their favorite music was or what their favorite childhood games were and finding examples of those online and sharing them with each other. So they were making friends, gaining an understanding of each other, but also getting those digital skills with the children, helping the older people. Um, it works really well and um, is really good fun. And I'd just like to show you a little clip of a film um, that we made to evaluate the pilot of this. So we also do a lot of reminiscence work um, with older people. So we um, go to different communities and create history clubs, invite people to come in, bring their old photos. We teach them to scan them and create an archive um, and mainly to share their memories. So we ask people to um, talk about different aspects of their lives and then we record some of that audio. Uh, and put it together with the photos in um, a digital story. So a slideshow photos with their audio memories of, it uh, could be a happy story, a tragic story. There's always a real mix of stories that comes out. Um, and these history clubs 
or just a, a real lifeline for some people. That's some of the feedback that we've had, that it's a lifeline, you know, somewhere to come, have a cuppa, meet friends, uh, meet old friends that you haven't seen for years and also make new friends. Um, so it's a really popular thing um, that we do that helps people to get digital skills in a creative way. Um, and that's not too in your face. Um, we've also quite recently uh, introduced a CPD um, program for this. So teaching um, professionals, people in housing and uh, social care to help other people tell uh, their digital stories. Um, we do that virtually. Um, I'll show you a quick clip of one of those and then I'll tell you a bit more about um, other CPD that we do. Jen came to the shop where I was working one day, all in his uniform because he was doing national service. And then he said, I'm going abroad. And I said, well, where are you going, Joe? And he said, I'm going to Paris. And I said, what, Paris, France? And he said, yes. He said, if you want to marry me, you can come with me. So that was a done deal, really, wasn't it? So I just went round the corner with him to Rick's sister Jules. Joe and I chose a ring. We got engaged. And I went back to the shop and told the girls, I'm leaving. Where are you leaving, Georgie? Well, I'm going to live in Paris with my new husband. So we um, do other CPD as well. And in fact, we've been part of Digital Pathfinders, which has been brilliant for us to, to create new programs to help to um, teach other small charities how to do digital inclusion work and how to do creative media projects with, um, with the communities that they work with. And we've had um, really good feedback about the program and the help that we've been able to give people, which is fantastic. Um, so I'd like to talk to you now about our flagship program, Digital Me. Um, so we um, developed this initiative with Gateshead Council a few years ago when they asked us to um, give a voice to looked after children, so care experienced children and young people. And they wanted to find out from them how could their lives be improved? How could the system um, be improved for them? So we, um, as you can see from the pictures here, we ask um, people to draw themselves and then we animate that drawing so that they can remain anonymous, but have a voice. We create a safe space um, and lots of different creative ways to, to have that voice, um, as you can see from the different collages there, hopefully. Um, and the impact of this can be uh, really wide. So I'm just going to show you a clip of one that we did last year with the NHS and Newcastle and Gateshead Councils working with care leavers to find out how their health could be improved. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to talk about your experiences of using health services as a care leaver. We want to improve things for care leavers, so your feedback is really helpful and we hope will help change things for the better. Maybe you could begin by telling us about your experiences. I have memories from being really young that are bad and I went into foster care with my brother when I was three. I was 13 when I went into care. I was 10 years old when I went into foster care. I was 10 when me and my sister first went into care. We thought we would only be in care for a couple of weeks, but that didn't happen. In 2011, I was placed with an older couple. This was just as I was leaving primary school. At the time, I simply put myself and a few things, a backpack and a couple of books upstairs in my room. I was five when me and my brother went into care. He got adopted and I went to live with me Nana. Then on the three foster homes. Sorry, I don't know if it was the same for you there, but I didn't have the video, just the um, audio. So sorry about that. It worked in the test this morning. Um, so the impact of that, like I say, it can be really wide. And from that particular one, although we worked with um, people, survivors of sexual abuse, domestic violence, mental health issues, 
Um, the one that I just tried to show you there with care leavers, they, um, so people talk about their experience and then talk about what they would like to see, what barriers do they have and how could they be overcome? And um, the main thing that all of the care leaders said was that travel is a barrier for them. So if they don't have, they don't have uh, very much income, so sometimes they can't afford the transport, the bus fare to get to uh, leisure activities or health appointments. And so Newcastle Gate said, um, CCG, the NHS, have paid for a one year pilot across both um, authorities to have free um, travel for care leavers, which is fantastic. Julie, I'm just going to have to ask you to wrap it up quite soon for the other okay. speakers um, to interrupt. Okay, no problem. Um, so the latest, we're, that was some programmes that we've um, tried and tested, but we are always trying to innovate and we've just started a new um, course with the help of Sunderland Software City, who've provided um, a fund for uh, laptops and other equipment so we can run employability courses for um for unemployed people to to use them to do um, simple graphic design workshops. So I'm really looking forward to be able to present on that soon. Um, and, and that's me then. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julie. I think it's really interesting hearing your own personal story of how you ended up working in digital and what strikes me from that presentation is how you use it to really centre people and their, and their voices and their experiences, which is brilliant. Um, if anybody has any questions, please put them in the box and we will pick them up at the end once we've heard from all the speakers. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Darren. Delighted to see you, Darren. <laughs> Glad you made it here. Um, and Darren Brilliant Kate technology. is from Suitability. <laughs> Darren's from Suitability and Suitability are a Northeast based community interest company who support unemployed men to look and feel confident when they attend interviews. So over to you, Darren. Yes, yeah, obviously technical issues trying to join, but uh, no, that was fantastic, Julie, really kind of interesting. Um, and yeah, kind of, I guess my story. So four years ago, I didn't have any, I guess, digital background. It was very much, I was an employment advisor working for a charity kind of based within Newcastle. And we had a lady on our caseload who basically, we facilitated a job interview for, um, but she came with the barrier of she didn't have the clothing and she didn't have the funds to, to basically attend. Um, so my role as kind of an employment advisor was to look at how we can kind of almost kind of get round those barriers. And we contacted a wonderful service called SmartWorks, which are a fully kind of affiliate charity throughout the country, which are fantastic. Um, so I contacted them kind of on behalf of this lady. This lady was suffering kind of a little bit of anxiety, didn't want to kind of go by herself, but we'd built up that rapport and, you know, contacted SmartWorks. They were kind of just, just bring her down. Um, and that's where the gray hair and the bags kind of started so I saw kind of what wonderful you know kind of clothing what you know kind of wonderful people donating and businesses can can do to somebody um, and she kind of went in had a dressing service um, got styled and then had um, interview prep confidence building empowerment and she went and, and got the job which was fantastic and I came away asking well well where's the men's service and you know kind of there wasn't so working kind of within the employability sector i knew that was almost kind of you know there was a niche in the market especially within the region um the, the region's always had the highest unemployment rate um and you know there's, there's lots of jobs out there but there's just not enough well, people are, are not really having the confidence to go for them so I started out of out of my parents garage i would uh, ask family and friends to donate suits I interview clothing and I would literally, I lived in Sunderland at the time, I would get on the met, uh, on the train with a suit carrier and, and gentlemen would, you know, kind of meet me in the library, uh, try them on and, and away they go. So the, the first suit I donated was my own to a young guy, uh, never had a job, never had an interview and, and he went and, and got the job and three days later he donated the suit back in, which which was brilliant because it was, it was my own suit and I loved it. So that was, um, you know, kind of, that was really good, but up up until kind of the beginning of 2020, so I had about 100 suits, and that was again no digital kind of presence. It was literally family and friends, um, and then obviously COVID hit, 
So I kind of obviously no one was going for jobs, no one was going for interviews, but I guess for my own well-being, um, my partner at the time had suggested, you know, kind of um, setting up various platforms, you know, taking some photos of the lovely clothing that I had donated in. And that's that's what I did. I bought a, a mannequin, set up uh, various platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and and obviously kind of started just really promoting what I was trying to do, trying to be completely transparent, but be the mail service of, um, uh, you know, for, for, for men. But, um, or, or, you know, with nobody going for jobs, no one going for interviews, I'd, I'd been contacted by Citizens Advice and they had obviously, unfortunately, people go to funerals. So no charity shops were open, but I basically kind of adapted the delivery with what I was doing. So I kind of set up a virtual fitting. So that was what the gentlemen were looking for. I would source the sizes and the clothing and then ultimately donate it to the door. Um, I think the youngest I've supported is 14 and 15 year olds. Um, you know, unfortunately, the, it was the granddad, but the dad had referred in and he'd kind of opened up that he, he didn't have anything for his, his children. Um, and then since then, kind of uh, as the restrictions started relaxing, I'd started kind of linking in with employability services, started opening up, started reaching out to services. So places like Next, um, they've been absolutely you know, fantastic because they can see from a digital sense of what I'm doing. So kind of the verification was there. Uh, they've now sent me about £20,000 worth of stock, you know, just from, from an email. Um, but seeing the difference of what te technology can do, uh, somebody had, um, you know, kind of tagged me in a post that Jason Manford had, uh, you know, he was looking at donating some clothing and, you know, kind of, I just thought, well, what's, what's the chances of someone like that donating kind of into just a very small service run by one person in the Northeast? And, and ultimately, yeah, he, he donated in, but then the beauty of technology is he, he put a, a, a basically a tweet out and within, you know, kind of two hours, uh, it, it, I think it was 260,000 views, um, you know, I was getting suits and clothing from New York, all over the country, and it just kind of, it, it went absolutely crazy. Um, and again, I, I guess the, the use of technology, I just, again, adapted. So, you know, kind of went from 100 suits to 400 within three months. Um, so I went from the garage to the loft. And, you know, kind of it got to the point where it was a bit of a health and safety hazard. So I, I remember putting a tweet out on a Tuesday. By the Wednesday, I had a conversation with a managing director of a storage company. And by the Friday, I had the keys to a 20 foot storage unit based in Walls End for free for nine months. So there's, you know, it, it's having that ability to kind of one, show what, what you want to achieve, but two, having that, I guess, resilience of, of being able to kind of do that. So, Fast forward last year, I think I supported over 100 gentlemen. 75% of those uh, were successful. Um, so it kind of went into meaningful employment. Um, everybody basically, you know, kind of it came through the virtual fitting because I, I still did it around my day job or still doing it around my day job. Um, but it means it's, it, it, you know, it is a fully sustainable model. Um, I've now got over a thousand suits stored in a storage unit we've got two community hubs so basically i donate the clothing and, and it supports their communities um and obviously started partnering up with organizations which is where adam and, and software city came in so they very much you know kind of um we, we kind of formed a, a really brilliant partnership so i supported debbie berry on one of their go reboot courses so they basically kind of had a cohort of um of young people effectively building a website for me because I didn't I didn't have one um, and I supported the, the gentleman following that with the clothing so you know kind of give them the confidence um, and basically at the end of the course you know they basically asked you know kind of what is it that they can kind of do for me so I'd, I'd obviously kind of said well I don't have I've got a point of contact website but I don't have the funds and I don't have the ability to do one and uh, you know kind of fast forward so I think it was um last month the, the the website finally went live um and it, it it it's been fantastic to just to see kind of the amount of services that are willing to support um but the use of technology you know kind of and and how from a digital sense you know obviously this year i think i've supported 50 gentlemen and i think last week we we celebrated our 35th into employment but you know i've got the ability to kind of show 
and, and promote what that does and and you know kind of uh, you know promote various services so if we if we do partnership work it's it's just kind of enabling those services you know especially if the northeast and the very social kind of driven it's it's given that back but as i say it kind of enables me to kind of keep doing what i'm doing and and ultimately keep supporting men um to look confident and um and yeah kind of go to go to interviews and get the jobs Thank you so much, Darren. I love I love the story. I love the sharing that happened in the sector. Have you been inspired by SmartWorks and then setting something up from scratch? And the, and how digital's added value to what you're already doing, but really absolutely. accelerated that. It's absolutely brilliant. And I well think done. Ninety percent, I guess, of suitability is is virtual. If that makes sense, you know, a lot of the mm -hmm. the, the role it, it enables me because I, I work full time. I can still still do my kind of you know my Monday to Friday job, but still have the ability to kind of um you know accept the referrals in they've all got guaranteed interviews um, as i say I've, i think the oldest gentleman i've supported is 65 to go to a graduation um so there is you know kind of it, it's having the ability to, to use that lovely clothing you know as i say i've got businesses donating in i've mm -hmm. got people but it's it, you know it's facilitating facilitating good quality clothing but to, to people who who need it most it's fantastic. And if anybody's got any questions for Darren, please just pop them in the chat. Um, and now I would like to introduce Andrea Perrett. Um, Andrea is from the November Club, who are an award-winning performing arts charity, engaging local communities in creating original performances that tell unexpected stories about people and places. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. And Andrea, what's about up. data? <laughs> Yeah. Sorry to give you heart palpitations at the beginning there with my struggles to get in as well. That's absolutely <laughs> fine. You're going to share my, this is uh, what with my presentation, aren't you? Yeah. Um, um, bear with me. Yes. That's no problem. It's it's lovely to hear the stories from Julian and Darren. And I think there's a, going to be a slight contrast between our story and that um, we've used digital pathfinders to help us do some operational work rather than work with um, beneficiaries. So I think it's hopefully it'll be a nice contrast for you. Are you finding that all right? <laughs> yes, I'm getting there. <laughs> Just tell me when you want to move through the slides. Yes, I will. Okay. So yeah, um, this is November Club. Um, this was one of the projects we did last year, which was a little different to the normal performing arts projects that we did. So we are a professional performing arts charity. Uh, we seek to tell original stories. We work in unusual spaces and places. We employ freelancers to deliver all our work, and we've got a, a structured approach, approach to developing their skills and talents. And one of the reasons for mentioning that is actually we're a very small team. So taking on the task that I'm going to talk about, which is developing a digital strategy, is uh, quite challenging when you have a very small team to work on. And I think some of the organisations that are watching may, may have larger teams than that. Um, our ambition is to create exceptional and remarkable theatre in unusual um, places from our home in Northumberland. So on to the next one. So uh, the next show shows you how small the team is. Um, there's four um, paid uh, part-time members of staff, including myself, and Khalil is a young associate who's a volunteer. And... Uh, the other uh, three paid staff have very specific roles. So Joe's the artistic director, so he determines all the work that we do. Um, Louise uh, supports him in making sure that we co connect with our communities. And Catherine is our marketing and audience development um, manager. So developing the data strategy really is mainly down to me, but making sure that I listen to the voices of those three and also to our board. Next one. And... I couldn't do that without Tom, who was my coach as part of the Digital Pathfinders. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about, we haven't finished. So we're on a journey. And um, it may be if you, you were to come back in six months, I'd have a little bit more. But I thought it would be helpful for you to see the journey that I've gone through in developing the data strategy. And this is all down to Tom asking the questions and setting me off down the route, really. So uh, I know my slides are going to be very busy, but I'll try and talk through them rather than you worry about the details. So can I have the next one, Anne? Oh, sorry, I've got, there's a why, isn't there? So why are we developing a data strategy? 
Um, uh, well, kind of, we've both got external and internal factors. And if I talk about the internal factors on the right hand side, um, we've got an inability to track the different roles that people have in our organization or with our organization. So, for example, our, our audience members on our mailing list do our donors attend our shows? We can't. We can't at the moment easily answer that. We can, our data is held in lots of different places, and the board wanted us to implement a customer relationship management system, which would obviously help us to answer those kind of questions. But I was a bit reluctant to um, just implement a customer relationship management system without really understanding what data we had and what we needed, and at the same time we get a, an, an external driver for us that Arts Council England, um, they fund 50% of the work that we do. And we are one of their national portfolio organisations at the moment, which um, there's only about six to eight of us in Northumberland. So it's quite a rare thing. We are going through a rebidding process that we'll find out in November if we've been successful in our rebidding. And they've set um, a new strategy and they've also they haven't told us how they want us to implement the strategy, but they have given us guidance. And one of the things they said is they would like to see organisations with a data strategy. So it seemed to me that this was an ideal opportunity to link the two. Now the next busy slide, please. So what did I do? Um, well, with Tom's guidance, what I had to do was map out all the data that we had. Um, and you'll see what I did is identify different blocks of data and they're the different colours that you can see on the screen. And the blue boxes identified uh, what, where the data came from and what we did with it. Do you want to just go to the next one? Um, and this is one of those blocks and I'm particularly looking at in the top left hand corner, I'm conscious if I use my mouse you won't see it on the screen, will you? So the top left hand corner we talk about freelancers. Um, so I did things like identify what pe personal data we had, what demographic data, what information about their roles, about their financial information, um, and also started the little dotted lines show how the data links with other sets of data. So on the right hand side, there's something called impact and insight um, evaluations. That's how we identify what people think of our work. Well. Part of that is asking our freelancers what they think about our work. So I went through this detailed process of identifying all the data. It was somewhat helped by the fact that in order to uh, review the GDPR, we'd done a review of personal data. So we've got a, an audit of personal data. But in this one, I'm also adding in significantly other, other kinds of data. So on to the next one, please. So then what Tom said we would do is we're going to build uh, a, a strategy based on what he calls data for action. And what he's done is given me um, a list of information. And the first thing you have to do is um, identify what your question is. And that's what's in the um, left hand side of the screen. So what question do you have that you think your data will help with? And the next thing is, this gives us an answer, which means we can. And the next thing is, which links to an objective or an Im impact or an aim. And then the next one is, we will use the data from these sources. So that identifies where your data comes from. And the final one is who, the, who will be maintaining the data. So, um, we needed to, this, this side identifies some of the key questions we were picking up. Um, sorry, the left hand side, I keep forgetting, I can't, you can't see. But what you'll also see is that the very dark red boxes, I've started to identify the data that we don't currently collect. So that's helping me to see we've got quite a lot of data there. It might not, it might not be in a consistent place, but also there's some gaps in our data. But one of the problems with going through this is that if I that if you can remember that big first um, colourful page, there are loads and loads of areas of data. And even for the freelancers, I'm only showing you three of the questions that I identified for the three three freelancer the three for the freelancers. Can you go to the next screen? So I ended up with maybe about I don't know about a hundred questions. 
And Tom said, actually, you need to focus on maybe five or six questions. So what I did was, having got a good picture of where my data was, I then went to the key strategic objects in our business plan, our theory of change, our equality, diversity and inclusion policy, our environmental policy, our audience engagement strategy and our financial objectives and said, OK, if I look at those five areas, what are the key questions that we need to ask about our data? And again, you're seeing three of the five that I came up with. And uh, the block in the left hand side shows you the questions I came up with and the colouring shows you where where that document came from. And what I'm gathering for the, from this is that there are some common grounds. So we've got a question around audiences. Where are they from? What, who are they made up of? We've got some questions about communities and we've got some questions about our freelancers. And I've, I took that to one of our board members. Um, I had two, I had, sorry, three other questions. One about was, were we, in effect, we effectively governing our organization? Um, I, can't, I can't remember what the other ones were, but I, anyway, I took them to the board member and we had a chat about what he thought was the most uh, important. And he talked about the freelancers, the, the structured de de talent development program I mentioned at the very beginning. That's a newish piece of work we're actually developing. And he said, you know, the focus of the data strategy needs to be on sorting out where you need data that you don't currently have. So we're gonna prioritize um, gathering the data for the freelancers and also looking at um, the audience members, because one of the other drivers is trying to increase our donors. And if we don't do some work on the um, audiences, um, we won't have the information. And I think that's the last slide. So just go on. I think there's just, oh no, that's right. What's next? So um, we've documented the priority objectives for the data strategy. Then I need to have a look at, do we currently collect the data? And if we do, then we can just start collecting it. But there are going to be there is going to be some data that we don't collect. So I need to identify how we can gather the data, identify how we store that and identify how we report on it. And then we can start storing and collecting. And I think that is the area where I'm going to start recognizing the CRM. And then that's it. So there's my contact details. If you want to know any more about us, then you can contact me. And I believe we've got questions at the end. Thank you so much, Andrea. Aside from all the incredible work you're doing on data, I think it's a really good example of how good quality independent advice can be part of an organisation. And I, I, you've no idea how happy it makes me for you to show <laughs> that the external um, person that you work with, you thought of as part of the team. Yeah. Because that, that is absolutely like the dream in terms of the programme. Well, I have I had no idea. I mean, I've got an IT background, but I had no idea how to do a data strategy. I wouldn't have been able to do it without Tom. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you so much. So oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And I will pay you later. Um, so before we, we sort of draw this to an end, I just want to pause and maybe um, come to Adam for a couple of reflections or if there are any questions in the chat. Adam. Yeah, we've we've had a few questions come through. One from me actually, which uh, you nicely answered at the end there, Andrea, um, uh, uh, and 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 spurred on. And um, I'll go. We've had one from anonymous. What what do you think, find are the biggest barriers for your uh, for, for using digital in your organisation and with your communities? So I don't know if uh, someone wants to pick that up. Julie, Does Julie want to take that one. Yeah, um, so a lot of. I would say the barriers are, um, with older people especially, is fear, uh, which is why we um, developed that intergenerational skills uh, course that I showed you, because a lot of people who, who are brave enough to come to our in-touch sessions, our digital inclusion six-week courses, will say that they're scared. And when we kind of try and get down into what they're scared of, a lot of people don't understand how the internet works at all so they so often people won't understand that if they touch something on the computer or the ipads that we use that that's not going to affect somebody somewhere else you know that they're going to break the internet because it's not clear what the internet is and how it works so yeah. that or they're going to break the device 
um, or just that unknown, you know, I don't get it. Um, so those are the barriers and we get around that by making it a coffee morning, you know, come with the people that you know from your community already and, and meet each other and we'll take you through it. And we always have two trainers there. And the reason for that is so that people don't get lost off. So by the end of the session, there's somebody going around. So we've got a trainer at the front telling everyone what to do. And then she or he comes around, as does the assistant trainer. And we keep keep everybody up to speed. So by the end of each session, everybody's done everything because we've um, helped them to get through. So we're not doing for them either. We're showing them what to do and then they do it. Um, right. And that's how we get really good results and really good retention rates because people see the benefits and they can see that if they do it slowly if they learn slowly and with lots of support that it'll be all right and the other barrier is always funding you know yeah. Yeah. I had mm -hmm. huge grant i could do so much more but we're always you know looking around for small grants for this and uh you know there's not a huge amount of money in the voluntary sector either to to contract us to do stuff so um that's obviously another barrier. I would love to be able to help more people each year. Thanks, Judy. The, the, the uh, topic of barriers to digital adoption is like a whole other presentation. I'm very happy to talk to people about digital exclusion for hours, um, but I think there is, it's two-sided, isn't it? There's the organisation exclusion and then there's the, the, the sort of individual exclusion. But yeah, sorry, Gavin. No, it's fine. I think there's just two other, which I'm just going to make points on. And it's my question, which I'll leave because uh, we can come back to that because I'm wary of time. We've, we've had our five minute warning, but uh, two points, one by Steve uh, Watmore. Uh, it's just been made around the fact that actually there's probably there's a role for, for the people making the technology and developing the technology uh, about making it simpler to learn and actually getting the base level right uh, for, for the novice user. And Steve, I think that's a, a critical and really important uh, and, and, and part of some of the discussions that me and Anna are having around how important it is that, that uh, one of the things that we can uh, really actively do as a digital sector and as a voluntary community sector to actually to, to, to look at what those levels might be and, and, and how we can work better towards them. Um, just another one really important one to mention, Graham might have disappeared by now, but Graham asked about how confident people were with uh, cyber security. I think uh, we could get into a very long discussion about that, but Conveniently, he has a session um, uh, at uh, the, the Innovation Festival on July 14th, um, and he's left contact details there, so anyone uh, in that space who wants to to get involved. But thanks for all the questions. Uh, I think, Anne, you're just going to uh, wrap up for, for a couple of minutes with this last slide. Is that right? I am. I am. Bear with me again. Yeah, give me a second. So, again, yes. In terms of what is next, so the Digital Pathfinders programme continues. We've got all sorts of masterclasses and the one-to-one -one digital support for VCSE organisations. We also want to look at digital expertise and charity governance. So we are building more partners to start looking at people with brands and really encouraging them to consider becoming a trustee of charities. Would love to speak to anybody about that a whole load of work around digital inclusion that we've sort of touched upon there at the end and and basically kind of build it start to build a community trying to bring the tech sector and the voluntary sector together and enhance understanding on on both sides so my contact details adam's contact details are there if you're interested or you just want to have a chat or a coffee just get in touch um we would love to hear from you so I think I'm just going to spring that slide down so I can see people. And I just want to say a massive thank you to Julie from Digital Voice, Darren, Suitability and Andrea from the November Club for joining us today. And thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Really yeah. appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you all. Great to be here. Thank you.